Uh, turn with me to Micah 6, as I said. Micah 6. Anyway, uh, let's open in a word of prayer because uh, we'll just ask the Lord to really come down and meet with us tonight. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We ask that you just uh, meet with us. You know where we're at this week, week, and we ask that you just strengthen the inner man and cause us to be receptive and preparing to receive your word tonight. And we just thank you for everything, and we say this in your name. Amen. You know, one of the things that people have a hard time believing is that one day we're all going to give an account. The Bible says we reap what we sow. There is a day of accounting. The Bible says it's appointed on the man to die once in judgment. And we don't have a second chance. we got to get it right this time around. But one of the sad realities is, is that God gives us all these opportunities to get it right, and we don't. And we have, you know, people sent in our lives to warn. I mean, a lot of our ministry has been warning people. And one of the things that's unique is that God, sometimes he steps on the scene and he shows that person too. But you know what? They still walk away from God. They still do their own thing. And you think... Well, Lord, why do people insist on doing their own thing? If they have these experiences, if they encounter God, and it comes down to the fact that they don't want to sell out. It comes down to the fact that they have this zeal at first, but then they lose uh, any kind of um, excitement because they don't have a heart commitment. And when God inserts himself and he shows himself in a mighty way, you realize that down the line that person's going to come under greater judgment. And you almost shake for some people. Because we've been around people that, you know, they've had incredible things happen and yet they can just walk away. And one of the things about Micah is that God is telling people you're going to give an account. And you're going you're gonna to stand in front of my courtroom, in a sense, and you're going to give an account. And you're going uh, to give me a reason. And one of the things that the Lord asks in here should really cause us to pause. Because, I mean, I'm thinking, if that was asked to me, knowing what the Lord had done for me, and it would bring absolute shame to me. <laughs> I mean, if I was in their position when they were asked this question that we're going to be looking at tonight, uh, I would think they should fall on their face and just cry out to God for mercy, but they didn't. They did not. And you think people just keep resisting, resisting. Their heart, hearts get hard. And, and, but they, they tack enough religion on, they think they're okay. And we're going to get into that too. And so anyway, Micah lived in this time where He's really contending with people because God is bringing these tremendous indictments against them. But tonight, he's going to ask them some questions. And they're going to have to give an account. They're going to have to stand before him and justify why they're doing what they're doing. He's going to give them a chance to do that. They're not going to have any answer, though. Because they stand guilty. And once you stand guilty, there is no way of putting it under the rug. Because you're going to stand guilty until that's resolved. And so as we get into this, uh, this particular point, I often think about what God would... Well, I think about the church today. And what kind of indictments... Is, would God bring against us if we're being honest? You know, and uh, I, I sit there and I sort of shake my head because the main thing that's missing is the fear of the Lord. The main thing's missing. There's no respect for his authority. There's no awareness that he means what he says. He says what he means. I mean, there's, there's no awareness of that. It's like, well, they're, they're getting a free pass. Call it easy believism or grace, but they're getting some kind of free pass in spite of how they're living. 
And so as I looked at this to, to this uh, particular chapter in Micah, I just sort of had to shake my head, and I thought, you know what, I see so much of the church in this. And, and a lot of the Christians' reasoning, what, what we would call Christians' reasoning about uh, what they're doing about it. And it doesn't change. Man doesn't change. And he, he keeps on putting up the same excuses, the same resistance to God, the same, well, let's get him off our back type of attitude. And God's not letting them off the hook. And there has to be a point where people realize God's not going to let me off the hook. He's not going to let me off the hook. He's going to call me to accountability. He's going to call me accountability. It's written out here. They had it in the law. There's not going to be any excuse. And so we know that um, Micah has give, had, gave the children of Israel three messages in his book. Of course, the first one has to do with warning. Lots of warning. Uh, but always in light of warning comes the second message, and that's the promise and restoration, which is always in the future. The third one was a challenge for them to repent. God so wanted them to repent, to turn back to him, to believe what he said. Now, let me tell you something. If you want to put God's wrath or judgment off, there is one key that will always work. It's called repentance. You put it in that you take that key, you put it in that door, and you can turn, turn the lock on that door. And it can be open to you. And you can see God push back the, the judgment he's bringing or the wrath he's bringing upon people. Repentance. We saw it with Nineveh. And you, you listen to the main cry of all these prophets is repent. Turn back to God. You're walking away from him. And the, the more you walk away from him, the further the distance is getting between you and him. And the more your heart is resisting him. The more you're becoming stiff-necked towards him. And so we see that this last key of repentance is a lot brought out here. But the Lord is about, again, to bring an indictment against Judah. Now remember, Micah covered both Samaria and Jerusalem. And you're going to see that the indictments are similar. People's sins are similar. What can I say? And the same indictment that he brought against Israel in chapter 2, you're going to see similar things in his indictment against Judah as well. Now, one of the problems is that he's going to show them that there is no place for justification for them except repentance. They will never stand justified in their sins as long as they stay in their sins. People have a hard time understanding justification. Justification doesn't mean you can do just what you want. Justification means that once you come to God, that he will receive you just as you are. That he's the one that covers and takes care of your sins. But you've got to come to him. You, there is no justification outside of Christ. Now, we are always justifying wrongs. We are. And if you have to justify, excuse away something, it's because you know it's wrong. You know that somehow it's not going to fit. And I've always told myself, get rid of your stupid excuses. If you have to excuse, make an excuse, you already know that you probably need to change what you're doing and do what's right. And that is basically a lot that comes down the line here. Now it's clear, as we will look at this, uh, that they refused his salvation. They refused his deliverance. And that's what happens when you don't Come to God to have your sins dealt with. You are refusing his salvation. You are refusing his redemption. It doesn't matter how you look at it. If you think that you can get into eternal life any other way but Christ, you're that thief that Jesus talks about in, in John chapter 10. They're trying to find another way in. 
You're also that person that he talks about in Luke chapter 13. I think it's verse 24, 25. He says, many are striving to enter in, but they can't. Because they want to enter in any other way but Christ. They want to enter in on their good works. They want to enter in on what they're doing. They want to enter on their best. But there's only one door, and his name is Jesus. And he's not a doctrine. He's not theology. He's a person. You've got to get the person right to enter into what he has for you. They didn't want to accept his salvation. They didn't want to go by way of salvation. It was clear that they had been disobedient. And the reality is obedience is necessary. Obedience is a sign of faith. Active faith results in obedience to what you know is true or what the Word of God says. Now, James 2 talks about that. Works without, I mean, faith without works is dead. Faith is active, it's living, and it's always ready to respond in obedience. Now, one of the things that we see is that God is not sending his wrath on them, he's, he's sending his judgment or his grievous chastisement on them because he has a plan for them. But it is grievous. And here's the key. There is a wrath in it in the fact that it falls on the wicked and many are destroyed. Those who are righteous, though, he delivers them. He maintains Israel through that righteous group of people or through the people that at least have not totally disobeyed him. And so you see there was a certain amount of wrath that did finally come not down on the children of Israel because they remained in their sin in that city of judgment, and therefore they were judged and tasted the wrath. While the others were spared of the wrath. It's the same way with Jesus coming. Jesus comes, who's he coming for? Anybody? No, he's coming for those who loved him, those who believed him. And when he comes, he's going to take us out, and what's going to happen after that? His wrath is going to fall. So you want to be part of that group, okay, that get it. They get it because they're, they, they trust God, they believe him, they obey him. And we're going to see some of that group down the line. Now, one of the reasons he did preserve the remnant of Israel was because salvation is of the Jews. Jesus would come through the Jews. He could not allow them to be totally wiped out. And guess where they had to be? They had to be back in their land, the promised land for that to happen. And at the right time, it happened. And one day he's coming back again. <laughs> And guess where Israel's going to be? In their land again. And guess what's going to happen in that land? Because there's so much rebellion today in secularism and so much uh, of the uh, religious garbage going on that many, two-thirds, are going to die. It's going to be that major. And only a remnant's going to be saved. And that's true every time this type of separation and judgment happens. Now, God pronounces a judgment to bring sin to the surface. And you have to understand that a lot of people, as they watch what's going on in Washington, it can get really discouraging, but God has to bring all sin to the surface so he can, what? Take the sword to the head of it. And so he has to expose it. And it is so vexation, it brings such vexation to our souls to see how wicked, how, how extensive this wickedness has been among our leadership in Washington, D.C. It has been pure, outright abomination in some cases, what they have been doing. And this is the Republicans, too. And I realized a couple of years ago, every politician's vote in, the, in, in Washington, D.C. is for sale to the lobbyists. And that's what di dictates a lot of the policies. It is corrupt to the very core. And I believe that there are roots 
still there because of the Constitution. There's people that believe in it. But I believe there's so much of that has become corrupt because the people have allowed themselves to become so corrupt for money, greed, and power. And that goes for the Republicans too. So we live in a time of tremendous vexation, and I believe that God's trying to get our attention, including the church's attention. Because they have just sort of, you know, hummed along. Instead of become that clear-cut light of right and wrong, to bring out that reflection or be that mirror contrast to the world. Hey, you can go down that route, but it's going to end in destruction for you because God does not change. Now, once sin is revealed, people, God sets forth his promises, okay? The only way we can receive the promise of redemption is by facing our sin first. And, and most people don't want to face their sin. But you know, that's what brought me to the foot uh, of the cross, was the fact that I was such a sinner. And that I could not deal with my sin. And someone finally presented Christ to me as a solution to my sin. And that's why I came to Christ, was because my sin needed to be dealt with. But if you live in denial of your sin then it cannot be dealt with. And you will stand condemned in that sin and you will be facing the wrath of God. Period. So you have to understand that. Now God will always deal with your present situation in light of future promises. You know the reason why we want God to deal with our sin, take care of our sins, not only because we love him, but guess what? We have a glorious future awaiting us. In fact, if you don't walk according to the future promises, you're not going to keep on the straight and narrow path. You always keep that future promise in light, in your vision, to keep you on that path. And that was true. God is always trying to give his people that future revelation so that they can walk through the present situation in light of that. And so you always have that incredible promise right here in the midst of warning and judgment. Here's the promise. Here's the promise. Now we need to understand that once we face the light of our problem in light of our potential, then we need to accept the call. You know what that call is? Oh, to preach the gospel. Well, no, that's our commission. Our call is to holiness. Our call is to holiness. We cannot see the Lord without holiness, people. That's what our call is to. To live a holy, set-apart life. Holy life that shows conversation. That's what we're called to. We may uh, have different callings as far as our positions, our talents, our abilities. We may be called to preach or we may be called to this. But we're all called to holiness. Look at his call to Israel. I've called you to be a holy nation. What is his call to the church? To be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. That's our call. And no one is exempt from it. I don't care who you are. No one is exempt from that. We are to be holy as God is holy. Because if we're going to reflect God, we've got to have that, be in that state of holiness. And that state of holiness involves humility. <laughs> Brokenness, humility before God so he can have his way with us. That's, a, that's simple. And once you accept the call to holiness, you're going to be the light in the dark world. Because you're going to be set apart by your life. The problem people are having is they can't see any difference between the visible church and the world. The visible church isn't offering them anything. The world isn't offering them. The thing that makes us so separate is that we have Christ to offer people. 
We have the source of salvation, the source of a new life to offer people. But if we're not walking in the way that Christ has called us to walk, how is anybody going to believe what we're saying? That distinction has to be there. The more the distinction, the more authority you, you're going to have in your testimony. The more authority you're going to have to speak in people's lives. They may argue with you, but they're going to respect you for it because you are showing them that you live what you believe. And that's the key. And so what was going on in Judah, of course, is they, here they had the temple, here they had all this stuff, and they were not any different than the pagans around them. There was no distinction in them. They were worshiping the same idols as a lot of the pagans around them, in the same practices and ways, with the same attitudes. There was no distinction. And God was calling them back to be holy. He's calling them back to be part, a royal priesthood again. To stand distinct again. And if you repent, that's what he's calling you back to. Repentance means I turn from going the way of the world and going the way of righteousness and holiness. It's not this little fuzzy little gray shadow area of Christianity. Uh, a missionary called it the misty flats where everything's sort of misty and there's no distinction. Our lives should bring a clear contrast and distinction from the dark world. They should. They should. Now I'm talking to myself because I know there's things that I say, oh, let's lie by. And God sometimes rail up. And letting it slide by. Did you notice your attitude the other day? Well, God, did you notice what you, how you handle some? Well, God, did you notice it, Rayola? Well, yeah. Well, what does that tell you, Rayola? What's the fruit of telling you right now about yourself? Well, my attitude stinks. What are you going to do about it? We've had that conversation a couple of times. But you know, we are here to do his bidding, not our bidding. We're here to serve him, not ourselves. And the core of every idolatry people is that need to serve, whether it's our feelings, our theology, our sentiment about God, is to serve something other than God. And it all comes back to selfishness and self-centeredness and pride, however you want to look at it. So let's look at what he says here. When we get in verse 1, Hear you now what the Lord said, Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has controversy with his people, and he will flee with Israel. Now I'm going to want you to notice who are the witnesses here. It's creation. His creation is going to be a witness. Now remember, there's two, uh, it takes two or three witnesses to confirm a matter. God is calling his creation to bear witness against, to be part of the witness. Why is creation part of the witness? When people are committing abominations in the land, what is the land going to do? It's going to spew, spew them out. And these people, before it was over, would have famine. They would suffer various things before the actual judgment came down. Because God was calling the land, the mountains, everything around them to testify against them as to their acts. Because they worship creation rather than the creator. They had high groves. And so they were worshiping that aspect of creation. And so the very idols, the very things that they were looking to was going to come back and testify against them along with God. And he was calling all of this to bear witness against them. Why? Because he tells us in Romans 1.20 that what? Creation declares the Godhood. 
declares the reality of God. It declares that God is real. And so, guess what? Creation is a very good witness. And it's going to be a great witness down the line, too. So, notice he says here. This is, this is very important. Because he is commanding them, you need to hear what's being said here. You need to hear it. Because it's a warning. And we have Jesus always saying, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Hear. Because if you don't hear, you're not going to be prepared. You're not going to be ready for what's coming down the line. So he says, hear. He says, arise, contend thou before the mountains. He's telling them, okay, children of Israel, children of Judah, arise right now. Because you're going to stand in the courtroom of the earth and you're going to give an account. Before all creation, your creator, you're going to give an account. So he says, hear all mountains. They're like the jury, right? They're standing there as a witness. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's controversy. Hear what I'm going to say against you in this courtroom before all creation. What am I going to say? And you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people. And he will plead with Israel. It's in this courtroom that God is going to try to plead with his people to bring reason to them because of what's going to happen. Now, this is, this is a sad question that he asked. Because remember, he's calling them in the courtroom. He's going to give them an opportunity to plead their case because they're going to give an account. Listen to what he says in three. O oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. Wow. What have I done to deserve your treatment, your contempt towards my word? What have I done to you? I often wonder how many time, how many he's going to look at what we call the visible church and say, what have I done to you that you've thrown my, my altar out? You've thrown my name out and you've replaced me with every counterfeit and every bit of heresy you can imagine. What have I done to deserve that? Notice what he says unto them. He says, Wherein have I weary you? Have, have, I, have I weary you by whining to you? By putting unrealistic demands on you? Have I wearied you with endless, endless burdens? Have I wearied you in that way? Now, can you imagine standing before the Creator and He asks you that? What are you going to say? What are you going to say to him? A God that's shown you so much compassion and long-suffering. What are you going to say to him? Yes, I'm weary with you. Well, why are you weary with me? Because I want to do my own thing. Is that what you're going to say? How's that going to, how's that going to help you on that day? Because remember, God doesn't ask you things that he will not enable you to do. There won't be any excuse. Imagine him saying, testify against me today. Before my creation, testify against me. What kind of account are you going to give? Now, here comes the Lord, though. You think they're silent? Can they say anything? They're not going to be able to say anything. But he's going to say some things. He's going to present his case. Verse 4. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants. 
I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. I want you to think about what he's saying here. Uh, this is pretty amazing, okay, because he's talking about the time that he redeemed them out of Egypt. And not only did he redeem them, but he brought, he sent forth Moses, who was the prophet and lawgiver. He sent Aaron, who became the high priest. And he sent Miriam, who was a prophetess. She was a prophet. To lead them to the promised land. He says, I redeemed you out of Egypt. I sent these people to you. Here you have the prophet, the lawgiver. You have the high priest. You have the prophet lady here. And they're going to lead you. I have not left you without the necessary resources. So how could I have wearied you? How could I have let you down? So let's go on and see what he says here. He says, oh, my people, remember the, uh, oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgad, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. Now, what's he talking about? Well, that time that, you know, Balak says, hey, Balaam, go out there and curse him. And he couldn't. He couldn't curse him. All he could do was bless him. And when it talks about Shittim to Gilgal, it's talking about the parting of the Jordan River so they could enter into the promised land. And it's at Gilgal where they dropped off the old manna and in order to embrace the new. Who did that? God did that for them. God led them through the way to the promised land. So why? They could know his righteousness. They could know his righteousness. Now, this is a little confusing, but the next one is the people in the way. Now God has spoken. God has reminded them. God has said, now testify against me. They can't testify against me. So what are they going to say? Well, it would be nice if they repent. But this is what they do. They say, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now, what are they saying? God, tell us what you want us to give and we'll give it to you to get you off our back. God, give me a formula that I can work out. Now, this shows how shallow they were. But what it also shows is they want to do everything but repent. That's what it shows. They want to do everything but turn back to God with their whole heart, repent, and line up to their calling as a holy people. They didn't want to do that. But they're saying, God, tell us what to do. We get you off our back so we can continue to live as we always have. God wasn't looking for some kind of action he was looking for a heart change and they didn't want to give him a heart change now how many people are like that today let me throw some crumbs at you lord so i can live the way i want i've seen this many times we have seen people come up to a point of decision either sell out or go in the world well if they're honest and they decide the world, they'll sort of walk away from God, sort of play around the fringes. But if they don't really want to be seen, they try to tack on some kind of religious activity, some kind of uh, religious association, so they don't have to let everybody know that they are a uh, son of Balao, worthless to God. So what do you want us to do? Tell us what we need to do. Seems simple enough, right? 
let me throw something your way. But what did God really want from them? They wanted to give the sacrifices, right? They wanted to get all everything out of God they could get. What did they want to throw them? Did they know what they really were supposed to do? You bet they did. They knew what God was after, just like we know what God's after. But do we want to give it to him? That's the question we have to ask. Do I really want to give what he's after? It's a lot like uh, the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. He came to Jesus and he says, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, why call me good? Only God's good. But he says, okay, obey the commandments. And he names six of them. He leaves out about four of them. And the guy says, I've done that. But you see, he was guilty of breaking at least three commandments. And Jesus didn't bother to ask because he knew that the guy would stand condemned Quietly, this way he would hang himself. Because Jesus wanted to get down to the core of it. He says, okay, if you want, this is my paraphrase, by the way. If you want to inherit eternal life, kingdom of God, then go sell everything. Because his God was greed, material things. And he was saying, you need to give up your God if you're going to follow me. I don't want to give up my God. Couldn't you give me some other formula? You know, when God presents something to you you already know, pay attention to what he's not saying to you. Because what he's not saying to you is what you're guilty of. And he's setting you up. And he's going to put his finger on it. He's going to say, you need to get rid of that. You need to get rid of that. This is what was happening here. They wanted to give God everything but what they knew he required of them. People in this type of state have no regard for the greatness of their sin. And that's the problem. They have no sense of their greatness of their sin. They don't have the understanding of the high cost of forgiveness that it costs because of their sin. Uh, and, and, they, and, because, and it all comes down to the fact that they were not cut to their heart over their sin. You have to be cut to the heart over your sin if you're going to do something about it. Your heart has to be willing to be circumcised. Call it whatever you want. He called them circumcised your heart. Get rid of that stuff that defiles you in your relationship with God. They wanted to give these sacrifices that cost them nothing. May I just be honest? But like David, in his adultery and murder, there were no sacrifices for them that they could give because their sins required, their sins of idolatry and so forth required their physical death. They had no sacrifices they could offer. But David, unlike David, David understood that there was one thing that he could offer, and that was a contrite heart, a broken heart before God over his sin. But they didn't realize that. Now, the issue of man, of course, is that he is in his fallen state. We all know that. He is treacherous due to his selfishness. We all know that. I think so. And it's only when he's changed by the power of God that his state changes. So let's look at what goes on. In chapter, in verse 8, he says, He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. Now at this time, Mike is saying, you know. You know what's expected of you. Okay? He wants you to walk justly. He wants you to love mercy. He wants you to walk humbly with him. That's what he wants from you. He doesn't want your sacrifices. 
They mean nothing. He doesn't want all of your oil. God cannot be bought. He cannot be bribed by our low actions. Micah is telling them right now, right here, you know. You know what God wants from you. Why do you ask these silly questions? Now, you have to realize that God has shown them tremendous goodness uh, in this article that's coming out in March. I'm writing about God's goodness. And I, I've studied his goodness, but I really studied it this time. And it is incredible what I discovered about his goodness. Because to us, it's a term, it's a term we use that makes us feel sentimental and good. What is his goodness? It should bring sobriety to you when you really understand what his goodness is. And he has shown them all this goodness. And what did he require? Well, Hosea told the Israelites in, in Hosea 6.6. 6, and Jesus quoted, For I desire mercy. Just about the same thing Micah said. And not sacrifice the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. That's what he was requiring of them. And they didn't want to give it to him. So ask yourself, what do I want to, what do, what do I don't want to give to God? I want to throw this at him, that at him, but what do I really want to hold on to God that I really need to give to him? Because he's going to put his finger on it eventually. And you can sit there and say, oh God, it's not that bad, oh God. Well, it's not how you look at it. It's how he looks at it. I learned that a long time ago, okay? So let's look at verse 9. Uh, the Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod who has appointed it. Now at this point, he's saying, if, if, if you're really righteous, if a person's really righteous, guess what they're going to do? They're going to hear his voice. If a man is wise, they're going to see what their responsibility is, what they need to do, they're going to hear about the rod that God's bringing down on everybody in, in Judah, and they're going to respond to it. Okay? And they're going to know that he has appointed it. Now, you and I are sitting in here today. We know what it says about the end days. What do we know? Because we believe it. He's appointed it. <laughs> You're not going to change it. That's what it means here. It's not going to change. He's appointed it. And the righteous, the wise person is going to see. They're going to hear what the voice of the Lord is saying through his prophet or whatever. They're going to hear it. They're going to be wise about it. Because they're going to know it's going to happen. There's not going to be any debate. Now, let, let's look at 10. Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that's abominable? <laughs> he says, what's still there? I mean, there is wickedness everywhere. There is abominations everywhere. We see it in our own country. We, we're vexed over it. And granted, there's a grandstand going on, but it's very much real. And it's very much out there. There's a point where you can't hide wickedness. And, and to these people, wickedness is a treasure. They value it. They're pursuing it. They love it. They like it. Whatever. But their attitude towards all of this is an abomination to God. He loathes it. And they don't. Now, one of the things you have to realize, he's also indicting somebody here. And it has to do, when you get down to who owns the treasures, uh, it's what we call the barons, or the, uh, the ones that were in the commercial part, and they were robbing and stealing, just like they were in Israel. They were doing the same thing. 
They were exploiting the vulnerable. They were taking things. They were using the courts. This is what they're making reference here to. It was blatant. It was out there. And the ones that were being oppressed the most were the vulnerable, the poor. Now, if you look at the law, God is very clear that you're not to oppress the poor. And if you oppress, oppress a widow and they cry out, God's going to kill you. That's in his law. And when you look at Ezekiel 16 about Solomon and Gomorrah, that's one of the things they were doing, oppressing the widows. It wasn't just their lifestyle out there. It was the fact that they were oppressing widows and they were robbing and they were living in abundance and, and could care less about anybody else. So we have these wicked barons here whose wickedness is out there who thinks that their treasure is a physical things material things he says shall I count them pure with the wicked balances he said shall I count them pure when they use wicked balances for things how many people are using wicked balances today he says and with a bag of deceitful weights. He says, they're gaining by using all this deceit, by changing the measures and the weights of things so that they can rob people. God hates that. Now we think, oh, God doesn't care about that. If I just take this, if I exploit this, it's not big. I want you to know God loathes it. And what's happening in the world today? He hates it. He will judge it. We think, oh, well, God's going to judge these big things. Look at this. This is big to God. This is big to God. Because you're oppressing the vulnerable. He hates that. When are we going to get that in our mind? You know, we're so busy trying to support our missionaries. And don't get me wrong. I believe in missionaries. But there's widows that need help right in our own churches. There's fatherless children that need support in our own churches. And we throw them into the entertainment world and say that's suffice enough. You think God's going to overlook that? You think that God is going to overlook these big mouth, positive preachers who rob from widows? You think he's going to overlook that? You think that he's going to overlook these pastors who fill their coffers so they can have mansions? They're under worse judgment. He hates it. He loathes it. And why would we support it? People are partaking of the sin by supporting these wicked people. It's obvious what they're after. And he's laying it out here pretty Major, okay? And he says, for the rich men thereof are full of violence. And the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies. And their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Nobody could trust anything. They were taking things by violence. They were lying. They were cheating. They were stealing. They weren't trustworthy in what they said. One of the things I have problems with Christians is that they, ha they make idle promises, and I hate that. I hate idle promises. They say, oh, we'll do this for you, and all of a sudden, hmm, well, what happened? Well, I guess they didn't mean that. One of the things, you know, uh, that we've had to teach people who's been part of our ministry, don't you drop the ball. If you say something, you do it to your own instruction or don't say it at all. You discipline your tongue. I have seen so many people lose heart because people have failed to do what they said. And then when you hold it to them, they get mad at you. And all of a sudden, their mercy becomes cruel. 
and they become judgmental. Because you know what? I may have said it, but I really don't feel like it. Well, I don't really care what you feel like. God said don't speak idle words. Don't make oaths. What you say should be an oath, yea or nay. And you need to mean it. And you need to see it through. And don't, don't conveniently forget because your life takes on a whole different dimension. We're living in that day, people, where the word doesn't mean anything. I, I hate to say it, but we're living in that day. And it's prevalent in the church. Shame on Christians. That's all I can say. Shame on Christians. Now, it says, Therefore also will I make thee sick and smiting thee and making thee desolate because of thy sins. What is he saying? He says, I'm going to smite you big time. I'm going to make you desolate spiritually, physically, in every way because of your sins. I'm going to take it all away from you before it's over with, including your life. For many of them, it would be their life. Now notice what they're going to eat. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. Thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold, but shall not deliver. And thou which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. All their attempts to save themselves is going to fall to the wayside. There is nothing that's going to be satisfying. There's nothing that's going to be lasting. It's going to be over with for them. Once it stops, starts, there's not going to be any stopping it, which is exactly what happened when it did begin. Now it says, Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil. And sweet wine, but shalt not drink wine. That means others are going to benefit from their labor. They will not. So we see that the land will be desolate and all attempts will not stop. The destruction is coming. There's going to be no deliverance for them once it starts. The deliverance is before that. If you study this, you know that he took the righteous people out before he brought this total judgment. On Jerusalem, excuse me. 16. For the statues of Amri, Am, Am, hmm. try and get that, are kept. What's he saying? He says, you keep all the statues to your idols, but not to me. That's what he's saying. And he says, and all the works of the house of Ahab, instead of doing the house of holiness and righteousness, you're doing just as Ahab did in his household. And you walk in their counsels. He's talking about walking in the counsels of wicked pagan people. That I should make thee desolation and inhabitants thereof a hissing. Therefore he shall bear the reproach of, thy, of my people. Wow. Now that's pretty major. He's talking about the leadership to a lot of extent. But also you have to realize that he's going to make everything desolate in Jerusalem. And in the surrounding area. And the inhabitants will hiss at it in disgust. In other words, it's like making it a joke, mocking it. And in the end, it becomes a byword. The people even become a byword because they are a reproach to the Lord. Now let me explain something to you. It's important to point out that our enemies want to respect us. Now that may, be, that may be a strange statement, but even Satan looks for worthy opponents. If you're some weak person that can easily be overcome, you're no match. They'll think you're a joke. They want a worthy opponent. And what it's saying is by this time, Jerusalem is not even a worthy opponent to even give any consideration to. Because of their sin. They want to see people who, when they say they believe something, stand for it. Because they can trust you better if they know where you stand. Okay? 
They want to see people who want to know what's true and right as to their God. And we, when, we come, when, when the weakness comes and they fall, they have, they have no respect. They have no respect. You see, Trump understands this. If you want a level playing field with your enemies, you're going to have to hang in there tough. And you're going to have to stand for what you believe, or they'll have you for dinner. You know who was the biggest joke to the world? Obama. He was the biggest joke to the world. He was a joke to me. And I have no doubt they said, oh, that wimpy little person. Now, when you looked at Putin with Obama, you could see, like, you're a joke. Doesn't look that way at Trump. I tell you that right now because he knows Trump is a worthy opponent. Yeah, he knows it. He respects him. And you have a whole different relationship. These people lost it, okay? They lost it because they failed to stand for what was honorable because they were called to be honorable when it came to God. Now, may I say this? The organized church has ceased to be a worthy opponent to the enemies. That goes for the flesh, which they give into, the world, which they have compromised with, and Satan, who's laughing. And it is up to the true church, it's up to you and I as a true church, okay, to stand strong, to hang strong, be strong where it comes to believers' faith that was first delivered to the saints. That's what we need to be strong about. We'll let God bring down the enemies, but we need to be strong in what we believe. We need to be strong, and we need to accept our calling to truly be holy.